I've uh, called today's message because I said so. There's something so authoritative about that phrase, isn't there? Because I said so. I remember when I was a kid and I had all these rules imposed on me by my parents. Why can't I touch this? Why can't I eat that? Why can't I stay up until midnight? And I remember questioning my mum and my dad, saying, why not, why not, why not? And I know that whenever my dad said, because I said so, I just knew that that was immediately the end of the discussion. See, my dad had this unquestionable authority that I just knew that I needed to accept. And so our scripture today tells us about the ultimate authority, someone with far more authority than my dad or your dad or anyone else. And as we're going to see, remarkable things happen when Jesus speaks. Why? Simply because he says so. So before we get into our gospel text that Yolanda just read for us, thanks very much, I want us to look at another text which I think will provide some of the backdrop for the sermon today. So you're welcome to turn to this uh, part of the Bible if you want, or the words will be on the screens either side of me. The first text we, I want us to look at is from Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 18. Deuteronomy 18, starting in verse 15. This is Moses talking, and he says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Now let's be honest, I have to admit, I don't spend much time reading Deuteronomy, right? It's one of those books of the Bible that we're not as familiar with. It's kind of obscure, a little bit abstract, a little bit weird, right? But where we would tend to just like brush over this passage and just, you know, flip through the pages, I can tell you this passage is very, very important for Jewish people. Let me just tell you about the context here, what's going on in this passage. So Moses is nearing the end of his career, nearing the end of his life, and he's giving the Israelites some final instructions just before they enter into the promised land. And as we read there, he promises that God is going to raise up another prophet after him, a very special prophet that they will need to listen to very carefully. Now, why is this kind of surprising? Well, for Jews, Moses is like the quintessential prophet. Moses is the prophet, the guy that all the Jews would proudly refer back to. You see, and, and every future prophet, all of their credentials were always measured against Moses. And if you were a rabbi and a teacher, and you wanted to get credibility with followers, if you wanted people to listen to you and become your students, you would always try and trace your teachers back to Moses. You know, if I wanted to be a rabbi, I would say to people, you know, well, I was taught by this rabbi, and he was taught by this rabbi, and he was taught by this rabbi, and so on, until you reach right back to Moses. Yeah, we know there were other prophets. There was, you know, Elisha, Elijah, Isaiah, many others. But Moses, right? Moses was the guy that every serious teacher wanted to be connected to. So it's unusual then that Moses says what he does here. Moses doesn't say, just follow my instructions forever. Moses says, someone more important than me is going to come along. A prophet will arise, he says, who won't just be a spokesperson for God, but someone who will speak, someone who will embody the actual word of God himself. 
And so I think it's important that with that text from Deuteronomy as our backdrop now, our gospel passage makes a lot more sense and it packs a far more powerful punch. So if you don't have to, but if you want to have the gospel passage at your side, you can turn to it now. Again, it's, in, it's Mark chapter 1, verse 21 to 28. If you want to have that on your Bibles or your phones, I invite you to as we look into, uh, into, into that in a bit more detail. And so what I want to say at the beginning is like, remember that Mark chapter 1, right? This is the very beginning of the gospel and Mark is the first gospel that was written. So here we really have Jesus right at the very, very beginning of his ministry. Jesus is fresh on the scene and Mark wants to show us just what kind of teacher Jesus really is. And so as we see there, Jesus goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath and he starts teaching. Maybe he's teaching Sabbath school. Maybe he's doing the, the main sermon of the day. Maybe he's running a small group. Maybe he's doing an afternoon seminar. We don't know. But there's something, something about Jesus' teaching that compels people to say, what is this? Here is a new authority that I've never seen before. You know, I like listening to Pastor Mark. I like listening to Peter and Shane, sometimes even to Luke. But this guy, this guy, Jesus, is something else. And maybe you think, well, what about the scribes? Weren't the scribes the best teachers that Israel had to offer? Well, yeah, they were. And the scribes were often administrative secretaries, or the scribes were, they were the best interpreters of the Bible. Some of the scribes were even lawyers, very smart people, the intellectual elites of society. And many of those scribes could, like I was saying before, many of those scribes would get credibility by tracing their teachers all the way back to Moses. But we're told that Jesus, Jesus doesn't teach like the scribes. Jesus teaches with a different authority. Now, interestingly, and I didn't know this before, but the Greek translation of this word authority in Mark chapter 1 is exousia. What does exousia mean? Well, ousia means substance, okay? And ex means out of. Isn't that an interesting and really powerful way of putting it? Jesus teaches, Mark says, out of his own substance. Mysteriously, Jesus is the very own source of his teaching. Does that make sense? See, every other prophet, even Moses himself, what would they do? Well, they would hear a message from God, and then they would pass it on, right? But it was always in a kind of second-hand way. A bit like if you've played that game, telephone, right? You pass the message around, but you're always telling it to someone second-hand. But when Jesus speaks, you're listening to the voice of God himself. Now, because I always think in musical terms, and I think, Audrey, you have a, a slide to put up there, one of my favorite guitar players, uh, Jimi Hendrix, have you heard of him? Well, let me give you this little analogy. This is how I think about this. Now, right, I, I could pick up a guitar right now, and I could try my best to play you a Jimi Hendrix guitar solo. And not to boast, but I think I could do a pretty okay job of it. And how could I do that? Well, because I've watched some guy on YouTube, and he's watched another guy on YouTube, and that guy read a book about guitar players, and so on, and on, and on, and on. And we could trace the teaching of that guitar solo right back to Jimi Hendrix, couldn't we? But here's the thing. Even if I played that solo note for note with no mistakes, you wouldn't be satisfied, would you? It wouldn't be good enough. It wouldn't be the real thing. It's not what you want. It would be secondhand. What you want to see, really, if you could, is Jimi Hendrix in his own substance, standing here in front of you, playing that guitar solo. See, the scribes and the prophets were masterful teachers. 
but Jesus, he was the real deal. That is why it's not good enough just to say that Jesus is one teacher among many. Jesus is not just another Confucius or Muhammad or Dalai Lama. Jesus is not even the best teacher. No, the claim of the Gospels is far bigger than that. That in Jesus is the substance of God himself. That's why we say Christ is God's word in flesh, incarnate, right? Okay, well, maybe you're thinking so far, this is all theory, right? This is all fine. It's easy to say that Jesus has this new authority, whatever. But is it actually backed up by anything? Well, I find this interesting. You know, specifically Mark's gospel. Mark doesn't really tell us much at all about, about the content of Jesus' teachings, the things that he was actually saying. You know, you think of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, and you get the Sermon on the Plain in the Gospel of Luke. And where those guys spend a few chapters talking about, they expound on Jesus' teachings about everything, anger, lust, divorce, oaths, giving to the poor, all of that detail about the teachings. In the Gospel of Mark, you get none of that. See, for Mark, it is the effectiveness of Jesus' teaching that really matters. And this automatically makes me think of my wife and her favorite love language. You know those five love languages? Her favorite love language is acts of service. She's not nearly as interested in the content of my words as their actualization. See, it's no good for me to say, yeah, I've really, really been thinking about putting up that shelf. And I've really been thinking about taking, up, uh, taking out the trash. And I've got some really interesting things to tell you about shelves and trash. No, she doesn't care about any of that. She says, I want to see you do it. Right? She's not interested in the content of my, of my thoughts about shelves and trash. And I think in exactly the same way, Mark, Mark's not nearly as interested in the content of Jesus' teachings as seeing his authority in action. What does it look like for this one who speaks out of his own substance? What does it look like for him to use that authority? In the second half of the reading, Mark tells us, doesn't he? A man possessed by a demon comes up to Jesus and shouts, What have you got to do with me, Jesus of Nazareth? But Jesus rebukes him and says, demon, shut up and get out. And the demon shuts up and comes right out. Now in the ancient world, getting rid of a demon took time and effort. Exorcisms involved complicated rituals, all this obscure equipment, and at least it involved some kind of physical contact with the infected host, right? Not with Jesus. Jesus simply says, get out, and the demon comes out. Who had ever seen such power? Elisha couldn't do that. Elijah couldn't do that. Heck, even, even Moses couldn't do that. But Jesus teaches with a new authority, an authority based not only on words, but an authority accompanied with effective divine power. Demons disappear because he says so. So maybe some of you are sitting here and thinking, well, I don't really need to know this. I mean, this isn't really relevant for my life. Yeah, I get it. Jesus has this authority, but I don't have any demons in my life. I can tell you that, yes, you do. We all do. See, another way of talking about demons is by calling them unclean spirits, a bit like Mark does here, right? 
calling demons unclean spirits. And as you know from your reading of the Old Testament, what does it mean for something to be unclean? Well, when something is unclean, it's the opposite of holy, right? So where holy means complete and perfect and in order, unclean means incomplete, imperfect, disordered. And I don't, don't, don't tell me that all of your lives are perfectly complete and in order, because we just know that's not true, right? So you may not have literal demons, but your demons are the areas of your life that are incomplete, imperfect, and disordered. Your demons are your brokenness, your shame, your guilt, your loneliness, your anxiety, your low opinion about yourself, your sin, your addiction, your bad habits, things in your life that aren't the way they should be. Basically, your demons are the messed up and disordered parts of your life. Uh, our last scripture I want to look at is from Corinthians. And in this passage, Paul is talking to his church members in Corinth. And, about, and he's talking about having disordered anxiety. And so in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 32 to 34, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, I should like you to be free of anxieties. An unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But a married man is anxious about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and he is divided. An unmarried woman or a virgin is anxious about the things of the Lord, so that she may be holy in both body and spirit. A married woman, on the other hand, is anxious about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And that might seem unrelated at the moment, but I think there's a connection here. Well, first, don't misunderstand what Paul is saying here. Paul's not saying that marriage is bad or anything like that. But what he's saying is, when we only worry about worldly things, right? Like how successful we are, how much money we make, even just how to please our spouse, that's what he's talking about here. When we're only worried about that stuff, we stop worrying about our relationship with God. And that's a very subtle example of a disordered anxiety. But when your worldly anxieties are held relative to God, then all of your other anxieties just kind of naturally start to sort themselves out. If Christ is your ultimate authority, I can guarantee you a well-ordered life will naturally follow from that. And we don't have the, the final verse on the screen here, but right afterwards, Paul sums up that point in verse 35 and says, I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. So disorder in your life can be hard to spot. And the reason why is because a lot of things aren't bad in and of themselves, but it's only when they become disordered. I think of the obvious example is something like soil, right? Soil is good and necessary when it's in a field, but soil in your house is dirt, right? It's about having things in their right place. Eating and drinking is good, but when it's disordered, it destroys your body. Sex is good, but when it's disordered, it becomes pornography, lust, adultery. Work is good, but when it's disordered, it becomes self-reliance and greed. Self-respect is good, but when it's disordered, it becomes arrogance and pride. So I really want you guys to ask yourselves and just hold this thought in your, in your mind right now. What are the 
disordered parts of your life. We all have them. Hold them in your mind's eye right now. What are the disordered parts of your life? Well, the beginning of Mark's gospel tells us some very good news. That a new teacher has arrived and he comes with a new authority, an authority higher than Moses or anyone else. An authority that is not only words, but words that contain effective power. Power to bring order out of chaos. So I want to just encourage you today and remind you all that Christ has the ultimate authority over all of your disorders. Because when he commands the unclean spirits, they obey him because he says so. So friends, just remember, listen to Jesus, submit to his authority, and he will rid you of your demons and bring order back into your life. Amen. And I want to invite you now. If you want to give your whole life completely to God, and if you want to submit everything you have and everything you are to Jesus, I invite you now to stand and sing with my friends here, Peter and Nick. Let's sing Take My Life, hymn number 330, Take My Life.